Hey, everybody, today is going to be fun. I even wore a, the plain black T-shirt. It's like the simple black dress, right? Um, because uh, we're doing black and white today. Um, and this is going to be this is going to be interesting. Um, so what what I'd like us to do is let me see here. I am going to start the virtual camera. And I am going to see if this works. Ah, I think this does. Ah, look at that. Like, isn't this, this is, this is like really high tech. Um, so what, what I, uh, what I want to do with you today is to, to, to look at, um, the idea of black and white and how this, how this can make our, uh, it'd just be a really fun thing for us to think about in journaling. We're going to look at this in a bunch of different ways. Um, the first way that I want you to think about this is that just in your work, think about your value range. How light is your lightest light? How dark is your darkest dark, right? Now, if if those are really close together, like if you've got, you've done all your work with a number two pencil, you have a value range like this from the white of your paper to the dark. And then all of a sudden, if somebody puts like 2B pencil in your hand, you're like, oh, look at what I can do now. I can do all this, this other value range. You know, the world just got, got a little bit darker <laughs> to your benefit. And, um, and there's lots of fun ways to, to play with things. So what is it that makes you see the light? It's the dark. We're getting philosophical here. What makes us um, see the, the the dark is the light, and so one without the other, we really don't have uh, we don't have a, a a place to go. Now, I'm going to show you <clears throat> a clip about light and dark, um, and as I as I do that, um, you're going to first think like, oh, I think I know why you you put this on here, but that's actually not the reason. <laughs> so see if you can figure out actually why I put this clip on there. Um, so this is the start of our uh, white and black. Um, we're going to start a little bit philosophical, and then we're going to get practical with uh, lines on your journal. But I think we're going to have have some fun. So I've, I've been looking forward to this. Now, let's see. Now, I'm figuring out like how to use all these little features. Look at that. Ooh, just pushed one button and bam, we're into this. And we hope that um, the audio is working. Um, Avea, if the audio is not working when I start this clip, you let me know. And um, we'll try to handle that. allowed this dark lord to twist your mind until now until now you have become the very thing you swore to destroy so let's in the obi one i see through the lies of the jedi i do not fear the dark side as you do i have brought peace freedom justice and security to my new empire your new empire don't make me kill you. I'm killing my allegiances to the Republic, to democracy. If you're not with me, then you're my enemy. Only a Sith deals in absolutes. I'll do what I must. You will try. Now, um, in in the chat, if you're if you're thinking like, why did I put this in there? Um, I'd love to hear some some thoughts and ideas. Feel free to drop that in whenever you want. Um, again, my apologies for the appalling acting for what have, could have been a really, really, really powerful scene. Um, but the uh, uh, but uh, uh, delivered with less facial expression than you see on Clint Eastwood, kind of sucks some of the life out of a scene but so 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 why so like what's what's going on with that your thoughts are welcome again here's your hint black and white black and white yeah kind of puzzling 
I'm, and not seeing anything in the chat. I'm just going to roll along with this. Um, back to Keynote. All right. Now, here's why. This was a great example of the black and white fallacy, which here in the land of nature journaling, in addition to how to draw and sketch, we are interested in um, critical thinking and reasoning. And the black and white, also called the either or fallacy and the false dilemma, you just saw a great example of this. So um, our bad guy says, you're either with me or you're my enemy. And this is a great example of the black and white fallacy that you're either with me or against me, because what it does is it sort of ignores that, like, no, there's also, you know, a bazillion little shades of gray between being with you or against you. And like, I'm kind of with you on this, but, you know, not with you on this. Like, so it's it's not this 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 binary decision. So be on the lookout for this. And when you see it, it's a great, uh, uh, it should set off red flags in your head that, you know, black and white thinking gets us into trouble. And another version of this is that, um, you know, okay, this, this solution that you have to this problem doesn't solve all parts of this problem. So, so, so therefore, it's, we, we shouldn't even try. It doesn't, if, if this isn't 100%, of a solution, then then anything kind of in between that you neither need it to like fix everything and be one hundred percent right, or maybe what if it's just a little bit incrementally better? Yeah, it doesn't solve everything, but it's incrementally better, huh? Um, so this black and white thinking can also prevent us from sort of the you've heard of this kind of another version of of this is you know the uh, you know the perfect is the enemy of the good. So if you're waiting for that perfect solution, and so you don't take a good solution, you're still where you were before, which is not as good. Um, so I wanted just to start our black and white discussion with, because we nature journalers are also interested in the whole process of how do we think, this is, is a great thing. So I want to challenge people to look for, and um, uh, you'll hear this on, on, on the news a lot as things are, are presented, um, is black and white thinking where we kind of ignore the shades of gray and all sorts of different possibilities. Um, and also the other idea that um, if you're not down with one plan, that means you're at a diametrically opposed pole. And the world's just a lot more interesting than that. But the reason you came here is probably because you wanted to see how to paint stuff with that, are, that are black and how to paint stuff that are white. And let's go there now, because um, drawing and sketching and painting these things, um, it's, a, it's a lot of fun. And there are some great strategies that you can use that help you do this. Oh, by the way, this, this bears, bears one, one other thing about that little clip. What, what I find, what I particularly love about it is that both the good guy and the bad guy make the same logical fallacy, right? The bad guy says, you're either with me or against me. To which the good guy, the Jedi replies, only a Sith deals in absolutes, which is an absolute statement. The Jedi is committing the same fallacy that he's accusing the Sith of doing. Right. So like only uh, a, a Sith deals in absolutes or, you know, parents when they're tired or sometimes everybody when they're not really thinking about clearly about things. People do this all the time and you don't have to be a Sith to deal in absolutes. But the statement also only a Sith deals in absolutes. So I'm going to have to get on my lightsaber and now we should duel to the death. Is uh, like the. There is so the word irony is is widely overused, but that is actually ironic that you're making a statement against an absolute statement against absolute statements in the concept in the in the in the process of saying like that's a Sith trait. Anyway, I just really love that. So that is some true irony there, and um, and I thought that you would you would enjoy that. So that's just for your fun. Now let's talk drawing black and white. Wing. Meow. 
All right. I taught, I taught, put he tat. And look, hey, with this holiday season, uh, we just uh, uh, enjoyed ourselves some, um, we enjoyed ourselves some Halloween. And uh, my daughters have a special love of black cats. Um, black cats, because of their reputation for being um, omens of evil, uh, if you would like to get a cat, you can get lots of black cats at your local humane shelter. Um, and every once in a while, I'll take them out and let their little footies touch the grass, but don't let them be an outside cat because they'll eat birds and that's just not good. And um, so let's just assume that this is an indoor cat that somebody has let out briefly to let it touch some grass. It's, it's well-trained, <laughs> like you can train a cat, and it's not going to run away because it likes your little kibble treats. But uh, don't let your cat go out and eat birds. But let's say we wanted to draw this. What I want people to do is just to squint at the kitty, squint at kitty, meow, all right? And, and I want you to note that um, it's there are lights and darks. So in drawing this black cat, what you really want to do is not just kind of go like, it's a black cat, get out your black paint. But notice that there are light patches on it. There are dark patches on it. And these are what give it contour and form. And really paying attention to those helps. Specifically, what you want to do is to look at the shapes of the areas of darks and lights. So don't think of shadows as sort of a dark region slowly blending into a light, because that gets us just to fuzz out all of our um, all of our shapes. Instead, what you want to think of is the dark areas and the light areas as having edges. It's not just a gradation of light to dark, but you're actually looking at dark and light areas that have shapes. You could draw a line between them. The minute your darks and lights become shapes, your drawings will get volume. The secret is that most people just do a generic shadow as kind of a little gradation of light to dark in the bottom part of something instead of looking at what is its shape. Real objects with angles and planes, um, you know, real kitties have planes. And so we want to, 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 to show those. So um, here is, here's this kitty and here is, my little sketchbook. And I'm going to just, um, I'm going to zoom in. Uh, it's not letting me do that, but it will let me do this, right? Um, what I'm gonna do is I'm going to draw a quick little kitty here. And can you zoom out? No, you're still not zooming. Come on, work with me. Do it the old fashioned way, bring the camera closer. All right. So let's let's check out how I would would go about doing this. I'd start with just sort of a light gesture sketch, saying, you know, Kitty has it has a head, and you know, Kitty has a body, and and Kitty's little body is sort of sticking out to the right. And you notice I'm just doing this lightly and loosely on the piece of paper. You know, Kitty's body slopes down, and this area here, if that's a unit of one, then this is about one and a half. Yeah, that's got it out all right. All right, that's working for me. Okay, and. And I've got an ear that is sticking up in here and an ear that is sticking up in here. And maybe that negative space between the ears can help me kind of place my ears that, that I like, love getting the negative. Look, look at that. My ears are too widely spaced. Looking back at the cat, looking back at the cat, bringing the ears in closer. Mm, chicka -chicka. Boom, 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 boom. If I just drew those ears in, I would have a cat with ears that were way too widely spaced. But instead... Um, I looked at that negative space. And so I am blocking in some kitty, blocking in some kitty. Um, I'm blocking in some kitty here, a little kitty cheek. Um, now the eyes, it's a little bit higher than halfway up here. There is a level of nose a little bit below that. Um, and let's see about the spacing of those eyes. There is a little bit more than one eyeball width between those. So if I have an eye over here, looking at the distance between the eye here and the edge here, more than that here, 
And those eyes seem to be lined up. That's going to be working for me. Yeah, all right. And now if I um, if I come along here and want to start drawing this, I'm going to start my little kitty here just with a line drawing. And um, where I'm thinking about sort of the, 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 the kitty edges. And so the ear kind of comes up. It's a little bit of a rounded thing and then comes down at a curve. So I'm going to go up a little bit of a, well, actually more of a point there. And then we're coming out and back in. And the cheeks are coming out. I will often, as I'm blocking things in, make my drawings a little bit more angular than I actually see them to help me kind of catch those, those angles. There's a little bit of a kitty chest there. There's some kitty side. And as I'm putting in the eye here, here's this is kind of a new little trick. Um, if I draw the edge of the eye, at this scale, my eye will end up too small because um, that line, if you're thinking of it sort of the kind of going along the edge between light and dark, a big part of my thick pencil is going to be down in the kitty. So what I'm going to do is I draw this eye, I'm thinking of giving the kitty cat eye um, an outline around its eye. So I'm not drawing the edge of the eye. I am drawing, and this, there's a corner up here, there's a corner down here. So drawing that lar more a little bit larger, there are some corners here and here at a little bit of angle on that kitty eye. And then the bottom hangs down from that. So to make sure when I get dark all around this, I am drawing on the outside of the eye so that all of the eye, and if you're drawing big, you don't have to worry about this, but on a small drawing, if you're trying to keep some light object like that eye in there, you are outlining the shape so that you're, again, you're not, none of your graphite line goes into the eye. You don't want that thick graphite line to be partly blocking over that because then you see as you drew that line, imagine this is an enlargement of this and this is just my thick pencil line. It's then made that eye too small, All right? So now what I want to think about is areas of light and dark. So where is, so this little light, this kitty has a little light widow's peak. It has a little zone here on the top of its cute little kitty nose, All right? Um, there is an area here on the top of its muzzle ball that is catching some light. Um, and then there is coming down in the chest, there is an area of light. So I'm just looking at, at the, the cat shape here and saying, where are you dark? Where are you light? And blocking those in. Then we have back of the kitty over here. And um, so you've got to go out to some little kitty hip and then slope down. And then you have some tailness popping up here. And then look at this in the kind of point of the hip here between the hip and the body. There's a triangle, a little shark fin with some grass sticking up into it, a little shark fin of darkness in there. And in this area, the tail is pointing towards us. So um, it is getting some, it's in shadow also. So what I want to do is I'm going to have this simple value range. I'm going to have white of the paper. I'm going to have my darkest to dark. I'm going to have some middle tone. And the critical thing is that I want the part that is kitty uh, dark to be really, really dark, and the edges between those things to be a shape. Oh, I also see that there is above the eye um, in here, there are some slightly pale areas. So I'm just putting a little box around those. So you see, I have boxed, I've boxed my lights. And then, uh, 
I am coming in here and I'm keeping my pencil stroke sort of smooth and consistent so that I get a big dull edge on my pencil. And that allows me just to kind of come along with it. And I am making this whole area under the chest of the kitty with a dark, dark edge of my, 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 my pencil. It makes me be able to get um, sort of fast shading. Oops, I'm starting to get up in there. I can't get up into that. That's where my light is. Notice I didn't have a good bottom on that box on the forehead. And I started just to fill up into there because I was on just sort of shading autopilot. So that's why I initially am putting some edges between things. Now for the color, the value of the, if we want to make this grassy down here, I'm going to draw in some grass things and then kind of go over the top of that, make it a little bit skinnier so you get grass blades coming up. Let's put a tall one in here. I'm putting in my dark value in these areas. And then what I'm going to do is put this medium value into here. Now, if I first of all, look at what happens if I put a really light medium value in there, then it just looks like there's a pattern on the cat because my light here is too close, too far away from the dark. So it looks like these are just patterns of like, there's a shark fin on the side of the kitty. It doesn't look like that's a shadow on the kitty. So what I want to do is make my, um, this middle value be close enough to the dark that our eye picks them up as the same sort of thing. So if I darken this a little bit here, a little bit more, but it is not as dark as that really dark area. So easy it is for me to get the shading in there because I have, there's just then there's a, a subtle little things in here. And that starts to feel like a cat with dark. Light. To make the lights stand out, I need these darks here to be good, consistent darks. So I'm coming back into them and just making them a little bit more sort of smooth vertical pupils here. So a couple critical things in this. I have some original shape. There is a portion of this that is darker. That gets to be really dark. And the boundary between them, the terminator between them is a shape. So I'm paying attention to like, oh, that was a shark fin on the side of the kid. 
As I put in this value, here they stand out as separate shapes. But if this mid value gets a little bit closer to that, then that becomes a shadow on get some more light or dark around those eyes. Those eyes pop a little bit. What makes the eyes pop is contrast. So the eyes are light because the cat is dark. And then I have, now mine looks sleepy because I didn't get the shape of that eye very well. Still looks sleepy, especially this eye over here. <laughs> Kitty's taking a nap. Um, I can get in there and mess with this and erase it, or just on the next drawing, maybe I'll do better. If something isn't working for me, I don't have to stress about it, but I want to notice what it is so that next time I can go like, yeah, I really mind those eye shapes. Because you might have a chance later on to draw yourself another kitty. Now, on this one here, look on the head of that cat and look at, let's, let's make that a little bit larger. Would you, big cat, look at the shapes of darks and lights on the head of the cat. Look at the shapes of darks and lights on the butt and upper tail of the kitty. You're seeing shapes of lights and darks. You will also notice that there's a little bit of red-brown in the fur of the cat. So looking for, is there a color cast to something is very, very, very useful. Um, don't just get out your black, but um, look at is, you know, is there a red in that black? Is there a blue in that black? If so, this gives you an opportunity to bring some more life and color into your drawing. So let's draw that cat as well. And this time I'm going to throw a little bit of watercolor at it. Now, move the kitty up. And what I'm thinking as I'm drawing this is I'm starting with like, what is the angle behind, behind the back of this cat? So I start with a negative space right over the back of this kitty. I love that first negative shape on something. So I've got a head that comes down. There's a little bit of a shoulder angle. And then I go into a flat back and then it turns around the corner, right? Maybe it's a little bit shorter than that. Then I'll roughly put in a head to try to keep this head proportionate with the body. Um, and then what are the angles here? Where we're coming down, a little bit of kitty neck. There's a little bit of kitty chest. There's a little bit of uh, angle down again, and then we're coming down. So I'm looking angle, angle. So straight down, angle, straight down, angle, straight down. All right. I'm looking at these negative shapes around this, 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 this kitty. Um, beware of making the head too big. Here's my negative shape on top of my head. Do I need to bring those ears in? If you just draw one ear and then you draw the other ear, you're almost guaranteed to have your ears too far apart. I still have them too far apart after you've been saying that. Oh, they want to come in closer. There we are. Boop. Oh, the cheek here. And eyes are coming in at about that level. Now, um, I am, 
I'm not going to put very much detail on little kitty friend here because I'm not seeing a lot of detail, but I am seeing patterns of light and dark. So I've got one pattern on the forehead. There is an area of light above the eye here. There is an area of light above the other eye. There is this really interesting area of light that comes out on the hip, on the, uh, the hip here. And then that comes down the tail. And the tail, then the tip turns up and notice there's a value change there. Where are the darks on the tail? Okay, I have, don't try to make it up. Look back at the kitty and say, all right, kitty friend, what do you have? I've got dark going on in the tail and then that dark comes up into a little triangle up into the middle of this tail. That whole front end of it is dark. Hmm. Now, I'm going to tighten this up with my pencil. So on this little line, I can, if I just put a few little doot, 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 doots, imagine I'm drawing a line like, like this, if I kind of make my line and I put a few little kind of things like that, it just sort of makes the thing be a little bit more conceivably furry. See that? This makes it like, oh, we've got some fur. But if I do just, it's, if it's all a solid line, then, then it often just looks a little bit more rigid. I don't want to make my neck too skinny. This is kind of a broad neck. And that means, oh, I'm having to bring my back of my cat up. Face of my tail. And we're kind of coming up here. We've got I'm not even seeing individual legs in here. So I'm just putting in a little shape that says, again, please don't let your cat be an outdoor cat. It's less healthy for the cats and it is devastating bird populations worldwide. Our, the number of sort of subsidized predators that we have released on natural environments is, oh, that eye shape over there is, it bugs me now, it'll bug me at the end of the drawing. No. See, I drew into the eye after saying, like, go around the outside edge. I didn't follow my own advice. Um, this eye has an upper edge. It has a lower edge. And then I'm going to try to be clear of this little area. We have a little bit of a kitty mouse. A little bit more of an angle here. Now, <clears throat> I'm going to paint this kitty. Paint the kitty. Now, there's two schools of thought. One is the traditional way of using watercolor, which is start with lighter values and then go to darker values. Um, and we can do that here. Another way is sometimes put in some, your anchoring shadows at the start. And we'll demonstrate both of these. On this one, I'm going to start lighter and then go darker. And um, so I'm going to start with a mid-value color. Now let's think about sort of painting black because there's a bunch of schools of thought on how best to paint black. And let's see, I can reuse some of this real estate on this page here to show some strategies for painting black. What color do you use? This is Daniel Smith's neutral tint. 
It is black. It's a great black if you want something just to be black. And I will sometimes reach for this in a little bit more of a mass tone. And you see, it's a very light, doesn't get through it very well. Super absorbent black. Um, disadvantage of this is that the there's it dries just being that color. It's not as, as interesting. Um, if I check this out, here's some brown on my palette. I'll squiggle this over here. Here's some brown. Let's see, was that raw umber? What are you? You are. People often want to know. Yeah, it's a raw umber. I'm going to get some raw umber here. And here's some umber in the raw, uh, raw umber. Um, and then I'm going to take some cobalt blue. And I'm going to mix this cobalt blue with it. And I get, I get a, um, a, there's a kind of a gray there. I'm going to mix in a little bit more brown. Now I'll put that down on the paper and see, I've just sort of made this gray. Um, I can mix things on my palette and get a more even tone. Oh, actually, first, before I, before I do that, let me finish this idea. So there's this gray that I've got by mixing those. What if I mix a darker blue and a darker brown? Well, I'm going to mix some endatherone blue here. There's endatherone blue, which is a really, really dark blue, and some bloodstone genuine, which is one of my favorite granulating colors from Daniel Smith. I mix those together, and let's see what we get there. Oh, my goodness, look at that. It's this crazy dark black. And notice that that's darker than that because the two pigments that I put into it the endatherone blue and the bloodstone genuine can go to a darker value than I get with uh, my umber and my um, and my cobalt. Um, actually, let's try raw umber to get things a little bit darker. Try raw umber and ultramarine blue. Look at this. But this time I'm going to do them a different way. I'm going to do them right. Look at this. I'm going to put some the brown on my paper. And then I'm going to get some of this ultramarine blue here. Uh, see, I'm getting myself some ultramarine blue here. And I'm going to mix this on the paper. So what happens is this color is mixing with this color on the surface of the paper. And it allows me to get kind of more of these sort of variations of the brown to the blue. Um, It'd be a little bit less predictable if I pre-mix it and put it on. I know what I get, and I get a much more homogeneous color. If I mix my colors directly on the paper, then there'll be these areas of the colors actually doing lively mixing on the paper. And if I'm doing this more wet in wet, so let's say I have, here is, here's a wetter, here's a wetter blue, I mean brown. And then I'm going to get that wetter, wetter this, All right? And let these come together. Um, come on, more paint in here. Then these colors are going to start to mix together and do their own little magic in their own way. It will be less of a controlled area of dark. Um, and it will be interesting. So you can mix colors directly on the paper. If you're, I'm doing a scientific illustration, I will tend to mix my colors in my palette and bring a known color over to my paper. If I'm being more kind of goofy and playful and wanting to let my paint do paint things, I'll let those colors mix on the paper itself. But the general strategy of getting a dark blue with a dark brown, they're going to make a black or dark gray really nicely. So those two play together. You can do that. You can also just reach over and grab your, um, reach over and grab a, um, a black from your palette. One other black from your palette that gets honorable mention is Payne's Gray. Um, Payne's Gray is, when you first look at it, you kind of go like, oh, that's just a black, just like all the other blacks. Um, Payne's Gray actually has a little bit of a blue cast to it. So as you see that kind of, kind of come out, um, you'll get a little bit more of a blue cast to it than, than you get with um, neutral tint. So, um, and blue is a color you see in a lot of organisms and a lot of shadows. And 
And so it's a useful thing. I wouldn't put that together with, uh, if I were painting on a yellow bird, I'd probably try to avoid the Payne's gray getting next to it because it would turn part of my birdie green if I tried to do shadows with that. I'm going to put the, make this dry so you can see what these colors look like dry. And this is not working. Oh, that's because it's not plugged in. Hold on a moment. Down here underneath the table as we speak. Oh, oh. Now, it's still not working. Why are you not working? Oh, you got a little circuit breaker thing. All right. Come on, you rascal. Mm -hmm. Oh, hey, Jack, not sure if you're um, saying anything at all, but we're having a little trouble hearing you right now. Oh, I have no, no, no interesting words are being spoken. I'm just, I'm just drawing this as I do. You can kind of see this blue color come out in the paint gray. Oh, um, we can't see what you're, uh, sorry, what you're oh. drawing. Oh, um, can you see my finger? Yes. All right. Yeah. See, there's, I'm just letting paint dry right now. This is watching paint dry. This is as exciting as it gets. All right, now, um, just to show you some of these colors for black, this is Payne's gray. So there's a little bit of a bluish cast in there. Compare that with neutral tint, no bluish cast, a little bit of a bluish cast, no blue cast, a little bit of a bluish cast, right? Um, and up in here, you can see these blues and the browns mixing together to make grays and blacks. Those are mixed on the paper. This was one, I think I mixed this on the palette. So we can put some paint into these. Um, and that's just a little bit of thinking about colors for, for making a black. Now back to the putty chat. Meow. Meow. All right. Um, so what am I going to do? I'm going to take some blue and brown. I'm going to get them together. Test my color off to the side here. Oh, I've got a big bubble of water there. That's a big wet brush. That's going to take forever to dry. I'm coming back. Um, that's going to be a little bit more controlled. There we are. All right. So what I can do here is I'm getting a, this isn't my darkest value, but I am painting over the whole kitty with this dark, but not my darkest value. And I'm gonna just do this kitty with two layers, one mid-tone, one darker. And, you know, down here, kind of getting into some of this zone, this is where we, you know, people will, they'll, they'll, they'll say, I'm going to get some, some brown and bring it into here. I'm going to get some blue and bring it into here. Let's make those mix on the paper. Like that edge there. What I'm doing is just sort of coloring this whole bit of kitty in. And then you'll see me get the
There's some paint on my kitty. Now I'm going to let this dry with extreme prejudice. There. So I've got kind of dark across the kitty. Now I come back and say, now where is the kitty really, 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 really dark? And so I'm going to mix up a black. I could use my neutral tint, but I'm going to mix a black today using a little bit of Bloodstone Genuine and a little bit of Indathrone Blue. Get those together. And let's see what they did. They made a black. Okay. And I'm going to look up into the face of the kitty. So along the inner edge of the ears. Oops, I'm getting my hand in my paint. Right. Along the inner edge of these ears is dark. Along the inner edge of the ear is dark. Um, then there's a little widow's peak of light that comes down. And we're going to come down here above the eye, and we'll come down here. And that then turns into a little area of darkness that runs on the inside here. And what about a little bit over the eyes, a little bit over the eyes, but not under the eye. That's interesting. Okay, so I'm going to go a little bit over the eye. I'm going to go a little bit over the eye, but not under the eye. And then definitely under the head here so there's a little kind of under the the head here and kind of getting up into these little kind of kitty cheekbone areas even and oh wow there is i'm leaving out all the color variation in the fur i'll we'll try to put that in at the end <laughs> Uh, it'd be better to have done it in advance. Um, so my my dark comes down, my dark comes down, and dark comes down on the back here, and then fades out here because there's a zone around the rump that is light colored, and then dark down here. Yeah, even darker. And is that no that area is a little cool for dark there? Dark, dark, dark. And what about on that tail? That tail is dark on the tip. And that dark comes down. And then that dark kind of comes up the tail a little bit. And I'm going to let that dry with a little help from my friend. All right. Now I'm going to get. Um, should have done this earlier, but uh, I am going to get uh, on a clean brush. I'm going to get a little bit of my brown here. We're going to get some red brown. Let's see what happens. Can I bring a little bit of that into the fur? Brown. And there, I probably should have done this again earlier. I'll just put a hint of red into that. And the edges of this are a little bit too hard. 
So I am going to soften that a little bit. But I'm gonna get my most of my bang for my buck by paying attention to where, where is the cat dark, where is the cat light, and believing those patterns. Last hair dryer. If I don't like um, some of the marks I've made, you can do this thing called lifting out. See, I did get my brush over here. I can come in here and make part of this lighter by lifting out a little bit of paint. Sometimes that does make weird blotches, but if I wanted to, so to see if I could get part of this to be a little bit lighter, I could come in there, and lift out some of that paint on the back of the kitty. I wanted to kind of see if I could lift out some of the paint on the forehead. Oops, move this over. Um, some of the paint around the side of the face there. And as I look around, if I say like, oh, there's some maybe let a little bit of light into here, into the dark, I can stroke that a couple of times and it just got a little bit lighter, a lot lighter. If that's too light, I can then come back later and also put more dark into it. What about along the side of the tail? Maybe I'll make a little bit of a hint of light here. Last thing I'm going to do in some of these areas is put a little bit of, well, maybe it's not the last thing. I often will say this is the last thing I can do, and then I do five more things. Try to break that habit. Um, but look at this. I can get a little bit of hair texture just like that. See, I've got my brush fanned. Woo, woo, woo. A little bit of paint on the end of it. Now, so if I do just a little bit of this in here. Maybe a little bit coming down here. This gives me a little bit of texture in those areas. Makes it look a little bit fuzzy. Try out here in the kitty cheek. I'm gonna get some strokes kind of going the direction that the kitty fur would. Oh, you can't really see that on the screen. makes that edge of that feel a little bit more fuzzy. Lastly, I want this kitty's, well, you can't see, there I did it again. There's my, my not last lastly. <laughs> Next, <laughs> I am going to um, give this kitty back its nose. Well, I mean, this kitty can't smell anything. Look at that kitty without a nose. Sad. All right, let's give it back. I'm going to lift out its nose. I'm going to come in here and just stroke that a few times. Then I wipe the paint off my brush tip. I stroke it a few times. And I wipe the paint off on a little piece of paper. And I stroke it a few times. Just a light little tickle on the nose. Kitty's getting her nose. What do you think about that, Kitty? Huh? Now you can smell. But you've got an off-center nose. You've got an off-center nose. Look at you. So let's make your nose a little bit broader. There you go. Look at you. Got a little nose back. 
Um, this is a white gel pen. It's really tempting to get in here and draw white whiskers on this guy. But if I do, they will be way too bold. They will stand out much too much. And, um, and I will be sad. So um, I'm going to avoid that temptation. Um, so here is just, um, I'm looking at patterns of light and dark on the kitty. And my kitty's looking this way. The other kitty's looking the other way. So I made a kitty looking in a different direction, put its nose. See, my kitty's nose is closer to the center of the head here. The real kitty photograph, the, that left eye is closer to the left side. So mine ended up looking the, um, uh, ending up looking the wrong direction. One last thing. Ha! <laughs> um that i can do um is i can also make this edge oh, look at that leaking pen don't put your fingers in that yuck um i can on this edge make it look a little bit if there's a few places where i can break that with a little bit of pen that will just give a sense of fuzziness. I don't want to do that over the entire kitty, but a few little places make that, especially where you kind of get a sharp corner. Then the kitty feels fuzzy. And I managed not to put my pen, my finger into the ink. Real good about that. I don't like the angle at this corner of the tail. Better. And stop. All right. So, um, mostly black. There, if you could see the original, there's actually you can see red browns and some blues, kind of poking up out of this color here. It makes it look a little bit interesting. Got some lifted out color, a little bit of texture put back onto the top of that. Um, and um, that is helping me kind of subtly sculpt some of these shapes in here. But wait, there's more. Because what if you're doing a bird? Well, this bird, <clears throat> it's a black bird. Um, this um, th this bird, we're, we're, we're seeing it mostly as kind of a, a, a uniform black shape. And I'm not seeing the details of all the wing stuff going on in it. So if you're looking at a black bird and you can't see all those, um, all those details, don't draw all those details. So here is a back of my bird. I'm going to just kind of bump, 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 bump. Uh, bump, bump, bump. And this bird has a little wing that sticks out. Little undertail kind of feathers, little tail there. Uh, this is my back of my bird. Here's my, my birdie, birdie head. And you can look over this way. And so if you, uh, have the uh, know the song blackbird singing in the dead of night and then there's that beautiful bird music part way through um you're listening to the european blackbird which this is it's a thrush um and when folks in the united states we think of a blackbird we think of icterids that are like the um the red wing blackbird 
that have uncle you know <laughs> they don't do that 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 song that you'd like to hear singing in the dead of night um so some people said like the uh the beatles got the wrong got sort of non blackbird music in their album um and they actually just have a, a different understanding of blackbirds than people in the united states so, now here you notice that I, I really can't see very much very much very much wing there's a little bit of wing sticking out here but um i want to show you kind of a quick way of of, of getting this that is really going to leverage that that lifting out so what i'm going to do is i'm going to paint this bird black and then i'm going to let it dry and we're just going to lift out a little bit of light in here and we're going to turn that into a wing and what i want um um uh, is to have this wing um sort of be as subtle as i'm seeing it up there um, this bird is fairly dull. Uh, this this individual is, is fairly uh, dull, so it's not glossy. So I'm going to get uh, the, for this one. Why don't I um, let's experiment with throwing in some indathrone blue, some bloodstone genuine. Test my colors right in the middle of my bird. And this one, because I pre-mixed my colors instead of mixing them on the paper, I'm getting a much more uniform sheet of black, color of black there. It's happening through tail. Got some tail feathers sticking out here. You've got others here. You've got a little cluster that are growing in. And so I am just want to show you what we can do with this approach called lifting out. And bring my friend the hairdryer back in. We're going to let this dry and then we're going to lift out another wing. There we are. Now to lift out, I clear my brush. And then I am going to in here lift out part of the wing. And so there's the secondaries. You know, as I kind of get a soft edge on this, we'll deal with that in a moment. But there's my secondaries coming in. And then the primary feathers are sticking out from behind that. Just go over the same thing a few times, clean it on a towel, over the same things a few times, clean it on a towel, over the same things a few times. And I'm going to let it dry again. Mm -hmm. 
Now, I'm going to get a little bit of light brown paint. And I can bring that into there. And let it up. And I'm going to go back to my black. And I want the edges on this to be really crisp. So I'm going to put some tight black there underneath that edge and tighten up the black on this edge to turn that into a tighter shape. And if I see, I'm going to get in my eyes and close there, and I can see edges of a few feathers kind of coming in. Try to turn on this light. See if that brightens things up. No, nope, it doesn't. What about this light? No, you can see what I'm doing a little bit better there. Oh, there's actually more wing coming in here on this part. I'm actually going to need to lift up some of this. The reason I'm getting my hairdryer in there with each pause is that doing this on a, you know, painting, um, if, I, if if the paint is if the the if the page is still wet, then I will get a whole bunch of uh, my paint sort of sloshing into other colors of paint. So I can rebuild that there. Now, what about that little orange ring around the eye? This is where I am going to bring in my gel pen. We're just going to make sure it works. It does. I want to make sure I know where I want my eye, how far back here, and I'm at the top of my eye. And now you're not working. Come on. Highlight in there. I let that dry. And the thing that's neat about a white gel pen is that you can tint it. I get a little bit of orange paint, not too wet. And I can come along and make that orange. I think I would want to let that dry and then come back in with another lead of gel paint, maybe lighter orange to see if I can make that a little bit brighter. Let's talk a little bit about now what I'm going to actually, maybe what I'll do is on this. Uh, to save time, I'm going to um, actually let's, let's do one other blackbird. Um, uh, who you are you you? Oh nope. Ah sorry. Ooh, no not you not you not you. No oh, nope. Kitty cat. And yeah. So this bird, you see a lot of iridescent color in it. Um, so as I 
um, as I go to 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 draw this bird, I'm going to do a kind of a really kind of quick little. This is this is our brewer's blackbird here in the United States. Does not have a pretty song like the, the thrush. Um, but you see a, a bunch of gorgeous iridescence going on in it. And um, so if there if you are drawing a black bird and there's there you see some really pretty iridescence going on, then let's make the most of that. Let's 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 play with that. And um, so a great way to do that might be to start overemphasizing the colors that you're seeing. So I'm seeing a little bit of green in the body. So I'm taking some, some greens here and just starting with that, that base color. And there, uh, there's a sort of turning blue on the back and a little bit of purple on the head. So I'm going to get some blue turning into the green wet and wet these these colors are sort of smooshing into each other and i'm going to let then a little bit of purple show up here on the back of my head and look at this guy i mean this is this is a this is a we're starting off a super technicolor bird here, right? All these crazy colors going on in this little black bird. And it doesn't look like a black bird. It looks like a green and blue and all these other sort of things bird. But that's my, my, my base coat. And if I want those iridescent colors to come through, then All right, now, remember Payne's Gray? Payne's Gray is going to come into service here because Payne's Gray is sort of this bluish gray. So if I'm using kind of a black here that has a little bit of blue coming through in it on something with these greens and purples, it's going to play nicely with that. So here I'm just going to use, kind of get up some of this Payne's Gray. And um, on the face of this thing, for now I'm pretending it doesn't have an eye, just to make my coloring here a little bit easier. I, I'm going over all this this part here, and then we're kind of you know we've got some you know edges of feathers coming in here, and we have uh, darkness going around here. I'm going to wipe off some of the paint on my brush and kind of dilute that. Get some black in here. All right, so we've got some little patches of color still showing through. And I can smear around with these. And you notice because my Payne's Gray isn't as, uh, the Payne's Gray is not as dry, the Payne's Gray is moving around a lot more than those colors that are underneath. And so if I want maybe more of that color underneath to show, I'm going to pick up a little bit of paint gray. And look at all that purple just came back into the back of the head. Oh, hmm. interesting. And this is too harsh in here. So I'm going to kind of smooth that out, move some of that paint gray around. But I want that green to kind of be showing through. And then I'm going to get more Payne's Gray, nice and dark on my brush. And here's, here's the edge of my wing. And here's the edge of the secondaries going into the coverts here. And then there's a little hint of some feathers. And under here, we're going to make it darker. And there, there is a, get down lower, 
Sure work, right? Oh, hey, Jack. Um, yeah. Just to double, is this one a brewer's blackbird? What kind of bird is this again? Oh, good call. Um, yes, Avea knows her birds. Check you out, birder. You like plants were your entry drug, and now you're an official birder. Yes, brewer's blackbird. Um, and, but I, I've been able on this brewers to kind of build up some of these nice darks around it. Now I'm getting some real dark here and kind of coming into the bottom here, just because there's some places that I want it to go to black. And I get to add my um, my eye later with a gel pen, and then I'll put a dot of, uh, then I'll colorize it, and then put a dot of black in the middle of that. And, and so there is, you get a little bit of hint of those iridescent colors popping through. Right, so this is one of my favorite um, Bob Bateman paintings. Hey, um, I remember when I got to see the original of this at the California Academy of Sciences when I was a kid, just blew me away that here's this awesome painting of a polar bear that you mostly can't see. He's just put all this paint over it. Um, but it's a white critter. You know, there's an old joke about, you know, here's my drawing of the polar bear in the snowstorm. Right. Um, and, but if you're doing a white thing in a white environment, how do you make this thing pop out? Um, and the um, let's see, let's figure out how we can paint a white critter. Right. So first of all, look at this. That's not a white bear. Hold up a white piece of paper next to your screen. You go like, wow, there's a lot of color on this bear. The hard part is if you're going to try to paint this bear and you, um, you emphasize um, putting in all these colors, it's easy to turn it into a tan bear. And so the hard thing on drawing something that is lightly tinted is your brain, you still want this to show up as this really pale light bear. And you want it to have contours you want it to be in light um, but depending on the light conditions your bear colors will change so here's a white bear with no white on it right um so how are we going to go about this um the on something like this it's a little bit easier you're going to paint a blue. Look, that's blue, purple, blue on the bear in orange. You can make a blue and orange bear. And look at how those light, the orange parts has a shape. The blue parts have a shape. So, you know, really kind of quick and dirty um, um, bear here. You've got a little bear tush sticking up, a uh, little bear face. And then we've got little bear feet coming down. More on drawing bears in a different class. But we're kind of getting this little, just the bear necessities here of this. And... And then we have it's hanging out on this 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 ice flow. So if this were a a, a watercolor painting, what I'm what I have to do is just accept the fact that color. Um, the color that I see of things with natural light on them will be different 
than what I will see when I um with with sort of the 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 bear in uh, under a fluorescent lamp. So here in the background, I've got all of this orange. And I have fortunately a hair dryer. All right, and um, I then have a, uh, what is the color on my bear? I have, it looks like it's, 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 a, it's a blue gray. There's a little bit of blue gray out there on my bear. And I wanna do the same thing of notice where it's light, where it's dark. And, and I'm going to give my bear let my bear be a blue bear, blueberry. And coming down here, the dark goes all the way to the back and it doesn't go all the way to the front. And I'm gonna put my blue paint on my bear. And I'm gonna put my blue paint on my bear. And back here, blue paint on my bear. I think I want my bear to be even bluer. Yeah, I think I do. And I risk of turning my bear to mud. I'm going to get more blue paint. Put my blue paint on my bear. Um, so this is just to say that just because something is white, it doesn't mean that it has to be white. Um, if I want my bear to stand out a little bit. That color back there, and then the orange on my bear pops a little bit more. There's a white bear that is not a white bear. But just jump back to that other white bear. Jumping back to that other white bear. Oh, there's a white bear. And, and what am I going to do here to make this little bear be uh, kind of look like a, a, a white bear? Um, I've got, so this is, this is a, this is a challenging thing. I'm, First, to kind of draft in this bear, the head is not really above the 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 the, the back here. I'm going to give myself a little ball for its head, um, and 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 a ball for its kind of neck fur, a ball for its upper chest. I'm going to use the three balls technique of drawing this bear. So I've got here's its chest ball, and tucking in behind that, we've got your body ball. And then you've got your hit ball. So essentially I'm doing, I've got, I'm doing this kind of a thing, right? Stacking some of these little circular shapes on top of each other. And here's little bare hips. So I find this, yeah, thinking of something <clears throat> as three, 
overlapping balls is really helpful. A little center line down the front of this one. And that gives me this bare leg. That gives me this bare leg down here, looking at a negative shape between them. And then there's the other bare leg down here. Bare neck is going to be a curve around here. Center of the bare, bare neck to a little bare head. And I'm going to draw in a triangular bare head. We can do a big kind of bear drawing class at some point in the future. How high up are those eyes? I want those eyes in the same row. This is not, if you don't have a really good telephoto lens, this is not where you want to be relative to a polar bear. Even if you did have a telephoto lens, this might not be where you want to be relative to a polar bear, unless there's a good way for you to be safe polar bear lives in an environment where it gets to eat everybody that walks by and nobody told the bear that we would like it if they just stick to seal when they get to us so point blue conservation science biologists who are out in bear areas that they have to be really careful and they know the behavior of the animals that they don't jeopardize bear safety as they're getting their data to help us make conservation decisions. There's a little bear shape. Um, and what I'm going to do is not get too worried about kind of making bear face and expressions. I'm now just going to put in kind of my bear has a nose. My bear has an eye and an eye, a tooth for a tooth. And I didn't make my bear head big enough, so mine looks kind of a teddy bear. Oh. My challenge is going to be to kind of get some of the color on this bear and not have the bear turn color on me. I don't want it to end up looking like a brown bear or a light tan bear. I want it to some people to say like, yeah, that's a bear whose fur is primarily white or light colored. Mine just looks... To, one reason my mind looks cuter is it's not looking straight at you. That polar bear that's looking its eyes locked on, locked right on you. Um, that's that's got your attention. Uh, I'm getting fussy about my bear head, which is not why we're here today. Um, I'm going to, I usually don't do this, but I'm going to go into the middle of the body here and I'm going to erase some of these preliminary strokes because I want there to be some white real estate in here for me. Okay. Now, what's going on? Uh, so one thing that's really important in here is light and um so where i see light i've got kind of a warm yellow light on the bear towards the underside of the bear that's turning more orange and then i have a shadow that is blue so <clears throat> i'm gonna have to keep this light but so test off to the side um I am going to try to put in some color on my bear. Now, this once you put it down, it's hard to go back. Um, so keep your places where I'm kind of seeing, putting these little sort of splashes of warmth into the fur of our little bear friend.
And now I'm going to put some blues into the fur of our bear friend. Messing up my light level here. Um, still not quite right. Got a lamp that wants to fall over on my table here. Come on, lamp. Be bright. Be bright. Make the bear bright. All right. So there's there's our little bear friend. I put some warms and some little blotches of color in it. You're looking for the all these colors of dancing light sort of playing with you out of the fur of the bear. And then I'm seeing that shadow. I'm not going to reach for my gray. I'm going to reach for a little bit of blue gray, light blue gray. And if I don't like it, I can always put another coat on, but it's going to be hard to undo it. But the big thing I want to do is not is to leave some places not in shadow. So where is the bear not in shadow? That is the question, right? And in those places, I want to leave the bear light colored. And notice this little rim of light. I'm going to leave bare. I'm going to leave the paper paper bare on the top there. And coming in here and getting some light in on this leg. Where is it a little bit darker? Where is it a little bit darker? And maybe a little bit darker down here. And then if I want to make that bear really feel lighter, um, if I give a little bit of value to what is in the background of the bear, here I've got a little bit of shadow violet. Let's put that around the bear there. And the bear just became lighter because there was some dark in the background. And contrast is my friend. Look at this. Look at this. This. Now I'm going to go careful in here. A little bit of a bear nose. See how much brighter the bear got when it got a dark nose? And lower lip. And an eye. Put that in. The whole bear got lighter because there's this dark moment on the bear. So these little marks in here make the bear fur that's light even lighter. So whatever little beastie you're looking at, you can use the same approach. By the way, for generally learning to draw mammals, doing a search for albino animals is a great strategy. Um, when you uh, when you look for albino animals, you'll get uh, photographs of critters without all the patterns on them. And that helps you understand the musculature and the structure of animals much better. So um, 
you know, just drawing yourself some um, animals exhibiting albinism or, or uh, leucanism uh, is a really useful strategy. So your missed, your, your, um, another thing that uh, you could do on something on a drawing like this is you could actually be much, get away with adding a lot more color into the background of, uh, uh, sorry, into this little weasel because you then would get to make the background much darker. And that contrast, remember when I put the darks in on the nose of the bear and all of a sudden it became a much lighter bear because it had that contrast of the face. So you'd want to really punch the darks on the face, but also you're able to put in those darks on the background of this that then make the shadows on the weasel feel like that's not a super dark shadow because I see what dark is when I get to your background. This one I wanted to throw in just to get us to look at like where are the warmths? Where are the warmths? Where's the warm light? Where is um, the cool light on this? This one is get, has both a dirty tummy but also some reflected warm light coming up on its chest, making the underside of this surprisingly bright. The upper side is in shadow and it is also reflecting part of the sky. Just as the water is reflecting part of the sky behind it, you've got blues of the skies coming out really strongly in the back of this thing. So let yourself put lights, uh, put warm colors and cool colors dancing together inside whatever white animal you are looking at. Look for where those are and don't think that you have to, that has to be, so there's, there's three things. One is where are the warms, where are the cools, and what is the shape of the shadow? If you get those, your uh, white critters will start to appear white. If you were drawing this, it would look it would not look white until you put that dark eye in and the dark of those tail feathers and the dark of the beak. So uh, before that, you're saying like, oh my gosh, I've got this calico snow goose. But the minute you put in those darks, everybody goes like, oh, I see. That's our dark point. So if the polar bear closes, is it, closes its eyes, it's much more difficult to draw. Look at the warm reflected light on the underside of this. See that? All those warmths, the warm light coming up there. Where are you going to put in your blues? Where are you going to put in your ochres on the underside of this goose? Right? That, that for me, once I realized that white things, it's not just white with a gray shadow on it, that you, it's actually this dance of colors. Um, the white birds, the white animals can come alive. And now a slight change of subject. Let me do a time check. Um, Want to check in with folks. This has been, you've been here for an hour and 45 minutes. Is it okay to take a slight left turn into a tangent topic? that I think is worth us to explore as critical thinkers? Getting some, all right. So to help us make this transition, um, let's just take, uh, get some help from an artist here. And for that, we need a music break. Neat. Whoa, hey, how about that? Um, so with that little musical interlude and an opportunity to watch Michael Jackson dance, um, this is um, this is a diagram of UV light um, that you receive on the surface of the Earth, the, or the UV index. So if you look at that middle line that uh, uh, on the thing at zero, that is where the equator of the Earth is. It's always surprising to me I always point, whenever I find a globe, I ask people near me, like, where is the equator on Africa here? 
and everybody puts it right through the middle of the Sahara, right, in northern Africa. And look at how low it actually crosses the continent. And then you see it cross over in Ecuador, um, and uh, which is a named for the equator. And notice that big streak of that big streak of um, orange going through right the middle of our globe. So that is the part of our planet that receives the strongest UV light. And UV light does, um, it does some, some really interesting things. So, um, uh, whoop, ah, hi. Um, so, so one thing about UV light is that it breaks down folic acid, which is a really important thing to have a healthy baby. And so our folic acid levels can kind of go down in the presence of it. Um, so for successful reproduction, being able to block too much UV light coming in has really big survival advantage. And so for a long time, people have been saying like, you know, the reason that we've got more melanin near the equator is that, um, that it causes skin cancer. And yes, it does. Um, at much, 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 uh, you know, 10 times more likely to, if you've got skin like this, to, to, to develop skin cancer. But that's, of course, happening after your reproductive age. So how can this be selected for? So it turns out that the folic acid is sort of one of the, 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 the key here, that if you've got your folic acid breaking down, oh, that's not going to be good for your survival. And then as you get, um, let's take a look at this. Uh, keynote. There we are. Um, if you look at sort of where you have darker human skin pigment, it's exactly in the UV light zone. Isn't that crazy? So the the so folks on the planet, people on the planet that have been in places with stronger UV light for a long time um, have, uh, there's this incredible adaptation to it. But then when you get up in the Northern hemisphere, uh, that layer of melanin, that dark pigment is then blocking uh, sunlight, which you also need for vitamin D in your body. So it's actually, when you get up to, to, to Northern uh, places, this is, it's you know it's 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 a problem um so as you look around the globe geographically you can find different skin colors in different places and because of that observation um it has uh it it led to the concept of the races of human beings and when this, yes, I'm going to go there. And <laughs> here we go. So just buckle up with me for a minute because I want to take a look at this concept of race from a scientific perspective. When you look at the distribution of skin color, you can draw a little line as they did in that map, right? Again, here is a line um, around a map. Um, boom. Oops, nope. You are on the wrong screen. Uh, there, right? Here's a map showing you can, you can map skin color. But this is not a map of races. And um, what, what um, the, because if you think of like the things that you use in your head for when people say like, you know, what is a race? The thing that people say the most often is, is skin color. But there's also this whole suite of other characteristics that uh, come along with it. You know, what is the texture of your hair? What is the color of your eyes? Um, what is your bone density? Um, what is like all these other sorts of, of characters? And as you map those different characteristics across the globe, the maps don't overlap. There's no overlap, but the, the, where you can like draw the line. Uh, you know, you, well, you can draw the line when you're looking at, let's say, you know, bone density um, or, or hair curliness you can draw a little line around those areas, but that map is not gonna map 
uh, match out uh, up with your skin color map. And it's not going to um, um, map out with, um, with whatever other sort of characteristics you're looking at that people think of when they, they say race. And so the idea of race, which was initially um, adopted and, and embraced by people in the scientific perfection who were kind of using it as sort of a justification of like, like if my skin color looks like this, can I use this as an, as an excuse for like why we're the best? Um, there was a lot of research done by scientists um, who were using that as, as a justification for, um, for, first of all, that there were these groups and that some were better than others. Bell curve, all these other sorts of discussions. Um, and as we are now looking at the concept from a scientific lens, these little maps, they don't overlap the concept of race biologically is not a valid concept in the human species. And um, yes, there are traits that are different in different places, but they're not kind of going together and where you would draw your lines. Um, there's, there's, there, there's no way to draw that line um, on the map. Similarly, looking at the DNA of individuals, the DNA for lighter skin um, and darker skin evolved even before um, the emergence of Homo sapiens as a species. So those same genes are distributed throughout the human population everywhere you go. Um, like there's there's a, there's a population in in. Botswana, that is the, the same genes are coding for lightness of skins as in Northern Europe. Um, so the sort of physiologically, the concept of race is an invalid scientific concept. But for Hunt, then we're going to add on. So that's, that's sort of like the scientific perspective on it. Um, but then you add on top of that, that that idea that this race is a thing has been used as a way of controlling and separating the human population for hundreds of years. And there's a history behind that. And that's a real thing that people have been saying like, you look this way, so that means I'm, there's there's the, that means you're this and 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 we've got you figured out, and this is going to depend on whether you are going to be enslaved or not. It's going to affect whether you are um, able to uh, be allowed to read books or not, um, and the and and still a lot of these ideas are in the back of our heads because it's been part of cultural dialogues for hundreds of years. Um, but for us to start to have a, um, a, a conversation about this, which is extremely, extremely difficult, um, something that is very valuable as we think about black and white, um, it was, we think about the concept of race that for us to understand that from a from the point of view of the the biologist the anthropologist who's trying to understand this kind of this this collection of of, of humanness that uh, there are these types and we can we can spot them and we're actually saying something meaningful um it it, it doesn't hold water and I think for us to understand that scientific perspective, um, that, you know, so, now, so, now certainly you can look at um, a, a person who has an aggregate of a whole bunch of these different characteristics. And you can say like, I am guessing that your ancestry is from Northern Europe, right? And 
this uh this 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 tends to work that is different than saying that therefore because i can pick out an individual physiologically whose ancestry you know i can kind of spot sort of kind of have an idea of where your ancestry came from um that this then breaks down into this works for having these sort of discrete units of um of of types of people and that's that's where things they, they the concept just falls apart um scientifically race is really hard for people to talk about especially people in the united states with the history of our country um and but i think it is up to us now in our generation to begin to um engage or not to begin to but to continue to engage in dialogue and to um to try to 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 make better decisions going forward in the future and try to correct some of the problems which we've created by the way which we have framed things in the past so science has been complicit in the past with sort of the uh part of the history of racism and as a scientist, we, we've got to notice that, acknowledge that. Um, but this new information is it's also coming from scientists, which I'm really proud of that. And I thought that this scientific kind of dip in the, 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 the toe in the water of this might be also just sort of a useful framing for us as human beings as we engage in a world um where we are we're, we're making these sorts of decisions and um thank you for this investigation today of black and white from everything from the black and white fallacy and how when we kind of think of you know that, that that's that's the same problem that we're sort of getting into with with race isn't it that if you sort of think of things like you know you're one of these two things um as opposed to a continuum of choices or a continuum of humanity um and um i hope you also had fun looking at how to draw and paint little critters out there that are black that are white um and uh let's have some fun with this and um with that i would love to open this up to any comments thoughts and ideas um from uh, folks in the the community and if we're we do end up uh discussing um uh you know issues of, of 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 race or those sorts of things i just want to remind people that this is a topic that that we as human beings we're really really bad at talking about and to as always we approach everything from the perspective of of kindness and respect um and we're not going to solve um any um big picture issues here in this conversation um but maybe we can be in dialogue. Thank you all for being here. So now I'm going to look over at my, here I am. Um, I can I can see you and also I can see anybody who raises their hand. If anybody has a thought, comment, or idea, um, anything about mixing paints, drawing black or white things, or examples of black and white things that you have included in your nature journal, or would like to contribute your thoughts about um, logical fallacies um, or understanding our species, all comments and ideas are welcome. You can use the raise hand function. You can also turn on your screen and wave at me. I would like to bring on Ann Chadwick from Point Blue Conservation Science. This is one of our our, uh, our, our, our leading conservation research organizations um, based here in California. Um, and you're the uh, chair of the board. Um, for folks who, who don't know, our own Ann Chadwick um, does great work with this organization. Thank you for being here. Thank you, Jack. It's so great to be here. Great to see you and everybody. And what a great session. And thank you for going there, for talking about 
the race issue while we're talking about black and white and everything else, all the the iridescence in there. <laughs> um, Absolutely. It's so important to talk about it and we are so bad at talking about it. So um, I would love for like our book club to talk maybe about some of the information that you're that you have or just continue this conversation in the community. So I love that you're you're bringing that up. Um, That's a great idea, Anne. What I'll do is I will put onto my website um, an evening chat where we'll kind of open the doors for um, humbly exploring this together. Um, and um, uh, we'll, we'll, we'll make that happen. Thank you for that suggestion. Yeah, I would love that. And let's see, I'll, I'll just show today was so much fun. Like there's <sighs> a bear in the storm and there's a bear with some of that blue ice, that glacial ice behind it. Mm, 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 mm. Oh, I love it. And it is it interesting hot. how when the, the eye and the nose come in, all of a sudden it's a white bear by making those really dark. Yeah, very fun. And um, yeah, the birds, yeah, I I sort of got it, but of course I'm just playing with kind of cheap paper, so. Yeah. Um, and do, yeah. do you have, do you have um, pigments that allow you to go really dark? I don't think I do. I think I need to get some better, some different pigments. Okay, so the, the next time we get together, Anne, um, remind me to bring my little paint box with me and I will um, squirt some colors that allow you to get darker values. Uh, oh, oh, Avea says that she'll bring some stuff with her on the 11th. Excellent. Okay, that'd be great. Oh, that's great. Uh, yeah. And then I'll just do one more show that I've just been playing with some flowers based on some botanical illustrations from the Royal Botanical Society in England. And Ivea is freaking out there because they're botany, but <laughs> it's so fun to, um, um, and I love this is um, the, the, the roots and the, you know, what's going on underneath, so. I have not seen your work in a little while. And since the last time I have, you have been obviously putting in a bunch of pencil miles because you've recently taken a huge, I don't know, recently, but since the last time I checked in with the work that you're doing, you have um, gone a huge leap in your ability to render and 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 use these uh, these these paints. Your pencil miles and brush miles are really paying off there. That's exciting. Thank you. And there's um, there's a an artist who I'm really enjoying. I copy people's work to try to learn what they're doing. And his name is Dennis Clavreul, C L A V R E U L, and he has a book called, uh, and it's quite new, called "In the Step the Footsteps of Audubon," and he traces Audubon's um, path in mostly the eastern United States and Canada. And he takes an Audubon painting and then does sort of loose studies in you know from where they were painted and and I just love his work. It's it's much looser, but it's mostly pencil and watercolor. And I mean, this is my interpretation of his work, but he'll just do you know a whole bunch of angles of bald eagles or different nests and he does some landscapes. Um, there was one I did of just, just, you know, uh, chipmunks. And some of them are just not even any, you know, it's just like, whoop, there's a little eye or there's an ear or something. And then some he actually finishes out and they sort of are overlapping and all over the page. and. So I'm really having fun with that style. There's one more um, pronghorns that were just kind of in all different positions. And oh, that's fun. Is this from from looking at 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 his work? Yeah. Or yeah, is, I actually uh... have. I could go get it. It's a big coffee table book that I just got at Book Passage um, a couple this weeks. Is, ago. This is the In the Footsteps of Audubon book. 
Yes. Yes. Oh, that is really fun. So that is lovely. really, 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 really fun. Yeah. But then I have a question. You ready for my question? Oh, please. A bring it. And it's not for you, Jack. It's for Ray Bonto, if he's still here. I want to know, Ray Bonto, did you go nature journaling on your birthday? And if so, would you be willing to share any, well, anything, but happy birthday. Uh, which that's, that's right. So Ray Bonto's birthday was, was Halloween. There you are. Hi. Right? <laughs> And, so, and, and we didn't have a chance to wish you a happy birthday. And you are such a dynamic and uh, important part of this community. Let's take care of that oversight right now. And um, so now it turns out, everybody, that when you sing happy birthday on a Zoom call, it's a complete catastrophe because everybody's kind of overlaps of like when they're, 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 they're coming in, it never works. So once you accept that, it makes it even more fun because the resulting cacophony that doesn't sound anything like a song is really pretty funny. And we're going to do that right now. So I am going to, um, let's avail, let's allow everybody to unmute themselves. All right, it's done. people can unmute now. So we want to invite everybody to unmute and we're all going to sing happy birthday to Ray Bonto in the way that doesn't work on Zoom. And so we're going to get all the lags from all of our feeds all over the world. And it's going to be a thing of beauty. Ready, one, two, three. Happy birthday, happy birthday to, to you. you. Happy birthday, happy birthday to, to you. Happy birthday, dear Ray Bonto. Happy birthday to you. <laughs> oh, that was wonderfully horrible. Everybody, thank you. All right. Um. So now. Um, uh, yeah, Ray Bonto, is there anything cool going on in your journal these days? I'll sign off. Hey, Anne, thank you so much for that. And thank you for the idea. So today, um, ah. See, and this is why we've got to get you some paint that goes really all the way dark. Ah, yeah, 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 yeah. Yep. So look at those areas of dark, areas of light, and look how it carved the face of that cat. It carves the body of that cat. And then are you adding... Um, did you add the light in as an opaque paint over the dark on that little cat that's looking back over its shoulder? Or was that, um, so was that light paint added on dark or a dark paint um, on top of light paint? Uh, light paint on dark. All right, so you added in some, an, an opaque light. That's really cool. Oh, that's fun. Yeah, being able to have those dark values. There's Blackbird singing. All right. Oh, this is really fun. And you've got a lot of practice painting those dark forms um, with, with a bunch of your uh, the pigeons that you've studied. Um, you do a really nice job of 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 rendering the volume on on dark um, on those dark valued birds. Thank you. <laughs> oh, oh, wow. Hold that still for just a second. I love the angles on this. I also, the way that you handle the pattern in the scapulars, that three quarter view on the head. This is a really interesting sketch. This is it's it's really cool the way that you uh, uh, approach that. Uh, uh, the few uh, weeks ago, uh, we went to Cornwall, and 
in the Airbnb they happen to be black cats. Wait, wait, hold on. Um, uh, a little bit louder. So we went to Cornwall a few weeks ago, and in the in the house there happened to be a black cat. Oh, and so you got to, to do some uh, paintings or sketches of it. Not the cat, but I did find two dead birds. Ah, see, this is why outdoor cats can't do that outdoor cat thing, folks. I know everybody thinks my little kitty wouldn't hurt a fly. Have you ever seen it with a fly? Yep, they do. So indoor kitties. But we'd love to see what you uh, what you did with those um, those dead birds. Oh, yes. Yeah, every time you get a chance to have a, a close look at a dead bird, like what you're doing with, you've got a new approach for the scapulars. Oh, wow. And we also found this rat, the dead bird. Oh, whoa, look at those ears. And the way that those wings are all folded around there. That's amazing. Look at the size of those ears and the big tragus uh, sticking up in front, the little bump in the middle of your ear is your tragus. And these guys have a, a, a an extended tragus that sticks up that then helps bounce the sound back down to their eardrums as after it hits the, uh, the uh, radar dish of the ear. Oh, that is so cool. What an amazing bat. And after that, we went to Wales, where we saw this unidentified raptor. Ooh. Oh, that's really solid. Hey, folks, uh, Ray Bonto did something that's really difficult to do in this sketch. Drawing a raptor and not overdoing it on the bill. We always tend to, to make the bills way too big. Um, but uh, to kind of get that sort of raptor face in without accidentally making the beak way too huge. Um, so great proportions on this beauty. And was it? Um, yeah. All right. Well, that's great. Thank you. Anything else um, going on in that journal? No. Not in the journal, but yesterday, uh, I think, I don't know if you know, Jack, oh, yeah. um, Rose, Roseanne Hansen is in London now. You got to meet up with Roseanne? Yeah, yes. she emailed me and uh, Rebonto and I, we, we were invited to a panel discussion on nature journaling at the Royal Geographical Society yesterday. So, yeah, that was fabulous. So we met uh, Rosen Hansen, we met Alex Boone, who was we, in the Wild Wonder Conference. Met Tony, we met Tony Foster. And Tony Foster as well. Oh, so, what fun. What fun. So Rebonto oh. took one of his journals over there and Tony took a look at it and he said, oh, I see a lot of Jack in there. <laughs> yeah and he saw one of the dinosaurs and he said where did you see that <laughs> it's fantastic uh, it was fantastic even yesterday evening. oh that's fun you know it's it's great to be part of this community and taking inspiration from all of these different people yeah. there are um uh, that's that that is that's fantastic. I'm so glad that you got to, a chance to meet up with Roseanne. And are you going to go uh, journaling or sketching with Roseanne? I'm not really sure. No, it's been raining. It's really bad weather now. Oh, yeah, it's it's really hard. Well, uh, we I, I was sure we were sure lucky when I came out there. Um, the uh, and I I will not uh, forget uh, both. Um, sketching um going up and finding you know the everything from the the the, the highland coos to getting out to um those incredible quarry areas with you and then to top our round our day out with um the most epic rock skipping um extravaganza that the planet has ever seen we uh we did it right the good found that out. place with no wind and it was good yeah, the yeah. gold mine of skipping stones. Yeah, that's what. That's right. Called. Yeah, this is fantastic. Yeah. yeah, yes. Yeah. Um. In terms of Alex Boone, I spoke to him separately. Really like his work. 
he is we don't see I mean Revonto's challenge has been his he loves the work but his inspiration is all in the US. Um Alex Boone is coming up um doing well in the UK but he's very far. It's about four hours from where we stay. So it's very difficult to meet up. He's saying he has to expand. So I did tell him that he is very interested and like to see his events come to London more often than what he's planning to do. He said, yeah, let's let's uh, look at it. But yeah, so it was a really good conversation overall. Oh, that's that's great. Yeah, yeah connecting up with, with, with people like that um, and actually to be in the field sketching with them. Yeah. If if you can arrange that, it's just sort of looking over somebody's shoulder, seeing how they think while that while it's actually going on. That's such yeah. such yeah, yeah. a um, such a treat. She lives in Devon, so if you said she, she lives in Wales, but it's Devon, which is still four hours away from where we stay. He has a session uh, where he invites people on just walks and nature journaling every Sunday. But we just can't do it every Sunday. It's just four, eight hours back and forth, and then doing nature journal. That does make it difficult, doesn't it? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. I hope he was closer. I wish he was closer. But yeah, but hope things open up in the UK as it's uh, in the US. Yeah. Yeah. It's fantastic community. Okay. Thank you. And and thank you. Um it's it's really good to see you both again, Arpan, Rebanto, and Rebanto. Happy birthday! That's that's great. Um, I would like to bring um, Hashi into the conversation here. Um, add you into the spotlight. Hello there. Hello, thank you. I'll just lower my hand. Um, I wanted to report that um, a few months ago I started the Santa Monica Mountains Nature Journal Club. And we've had two, we had a meetup in September and in October. Our next one in November is going to be at our local tide pools. We're going to have a nice low tide um, during the day. So we're very excited about that. And it's really taken off well. I've got 31 people on the mailing list now, which is like more than I want. So I mean, if they all showed up, it would be chaos. (laughs) So, um, and, you know, I'm getting... Uh, referrals through through the wild wonder map and calendar which is great Um, but also friends are telling friends Um, I put flyers in libraries Um, people have just googled it like nature journaling in my area kind of thing and found me and And, so are are, are you on the are you on the map that we have on the wild Wild wonder page Mm -hmm. okay so that's another good point for people that's Mm -hmm. that's fantastic yeah so I'm super just pumped about the whole thing it there was obviously you know a vacuum for a nature journal club here in time to make that happen southern california so um yeah that's that's really good news i'm um i'm also um the in the chair of the interpretive committee for the docent association at the state park where i where i spend a lot of time and we are doing nature journaling now as part of our docent training so I just did a session with um, Docent as a continuing edu- education program a couple of weekends ago um, that went down really well. Um, so, yeah, it's been fun. Um, but actually what I'm excited about, I wanted to show my journal page. I just want to I just want to talk about the thrill of a cheap microscope. And one thing I just really love doing is looking at little things close up and I you know I was just I just picked a cucumber and it's it's spiky I was scrubbing the spines off and then I was like maybe I'll just have a look at one of these spines you know and it's such fun to I mean I have a it's a cheap microscope I got off Craigslist for 10 bucks you know I don't know you know but just to be able to look at something up close like that it's just to me it's just like Oh, it's like the heavens open and you see, you know, like when you look at little globules of stickiness on a leaf or something, you know, to me, it's such a thrill to, to look at something, to magnify something and look at it. So I just encourage everyone to, um, you know, sure, draw your mammals, but also look at things really close up. It's fun. That is such a good idea. That is such a good idea. 
And what an invitation to do that. So yeah, everybody out who, who's listened to this, let's, uh, I want to encourage folks to, as, as a way of find yourself some magnifier form, some, some form of magnifier and, and whatever you're looking at just got that much more interesting. Um, another thing that is fun to do uh, is uh, if you haven't uh, done this before um, or, or done it in a while, um, look up the video of powers of 10. And mm -hmm. it just sort of makes you think of magnifying things gets you into this whole sort of idea of scale and proportion. And um, the the video called powers of 10 um, it's, it is, uh, it's been out for a long time, but it, it's one of these things that, that holds up the time. I'm, I'm just currently reading a book by, um, uh, by, by, why am I blanking on, on his name? One of my, uh, favorite people, um, millions and billions, our, our favorite astrobiologist. Why? Neil deGrasse Tyson? Uh, um, not not uh, Neil deGrasse Tyson. Carl Sagan. Carl Sagan. Thank you. Why couldn't I say Carl Sagan? So I'm I'm reading his book right now. I should know <laughs> his name, right? Yes. Thank you, Ed. Yeah, yeah. Carl Sagan. Um. So and and he reminded me of that that video, and I went and took a look at it again, and it was and it's really it's it's a wonderful kind of perspective called uh, Powers of Ten. Um, and uh, the now what we're seeing from the James Webb Space Telescope. You know, it just adds on the other end all this other sort of structure and dimension beyond what we were able to perceive before. Um, but that's that's really fun. So shout out to Carl. Um, and um, if people are interested, uh, the book is called The Demon Haunted World, and it is it is mad fun. It is mad fun. Um, so uh, yeah, and and Hashi, thank you so much for the suggestion of people kind of focus. And if you are in the LA area, um, folks should look you up. Thank you so much. Oh, sorry, you accidentally got it muted there. Yeah. I've got to go. Bye. Okay, take care. <laughs> um, that's fun. Hey, um. About to end here because I am about to drop over to my daughter's school to teach a combined art science lesson. Who knew you could do such things? Um, before I do, I want to bring in our amazing co-host, Avea, the mad botanist more. Everybody give it up for Avea. Yay! Really good to see you. Thank you so much for being with us today. Thank you for shepherding this group. I, I want to send out a personal thank you to you for all your help in doing this. And I'm really happy to um, be a co-conspirator with you in making some fun things happen. Same, same, Jack. Thank you. Thank you so much for letting me be here with you and with all of you. Thank you. This is great. So from us to all of you, um, we just want to wish you uh, kindness, peace, and may you find beauty and solace in nature. Um, and want, we want to encourage you to get out into this world with your journal in your hand and let some of these mysteries, perhaps magnified, um, delight and inspire you and perhaps delight and inspire you to be kind to people near you and to together take care of this beautiful planet that we all share. Um, so, oh, and, and next week, I may be here or I may not. Um, and the reason that it's a maybe kind of thing is because I find out tomorrow if I'm on a jury. And if if so, I will be gone for, it looks like it's about a month long trial. And I don't fit the criteria for excusing yourself and also consider it kind of part of my civic duty and be honored to serve. Um, although I would really miss this community. So I, if I am gone for a little while, it's not because I don't love you anymore. I'm not going away. And, um, but um, there's somebody that needs help from a juror who can um, listen and um, evaluate things on the basis of evidence. And that's what we're all about anyway. So what you're about to say something, Avea. 
Oh, no, no. Um, I was going to, um, E had just asked about next week, so and you already were on it answering it. I was also going to say, speaking of taking care of the planet, an announcement I didn't give earlier. Um, it's not ready yet, but I am in process of editing the first seven stewardship stories of nature journalers in this community who I interviewed. I bring this up because Hashi, who was just on, was one of those seven. And so her story and others, and in future, even more people who I plan to interview, Anne, Jack, others, please contact me. Um, we're going to be hearing from more stories in the community of, of people who are trying to make the world a better place and how. Um, when that begins, I'll let people know when it's going to get started. It'll be on my YouTube channel and hopefully also reproduced on the Wild Wonders website. Um, so I wanted to mention that. Hashi reminded me. Um, more to come. Thank you. What an awesome project. Um, thank you for doing that. Thank you for telling those stories because um, you know we're a social primate. We learn from each other and by we can be inspired by somebody else's experience and that motivates us to do something. Um, thank you for doing that. Thank you for being here. And I look forward to um, more shenanigans to come. Friends, this is far from over and we will see you again soon. Bye-bye everybody. Everyone and thank you, Jack. <laughs>